what I'd like to do is I want to take you on a data journey. And first, we'll go a bit back in time, and then we'll go a bit forward. Uh, do you remember what you did in 1990? 1990 was the year of German reunification, and also Germany won the World Cup in that year. But for me, it was also a big year because I finished school and then decided to travel through Africa from Cape Town to Cairo. And that was when I was 19. And uh, starting in South Africa, going then through the various countries, this picture was taken in Ken Eastern Kenya on the way to Somalia. Somalia at that time was a very troubled country, but it got only worse. But at that time, you could still travel and enter it, although I was quite naive in this trip and having not been properly informed myself, because it also also the time of this generation where we didn't have all the information at our fingertips. And when I still remember, I think of this, this experience, which was still the most important journey and travel of my lifetime, I'm very impressed how my mother handled it. I'm the only child, she was a single mom, and she supported me throughout. And remember, at that time, there was no cell phones, there was no internet, um, there was no email. Um, cell phones, if it, they existed, were, were um, impossible to buy, were too expensive, and to Africa you couldn't connect either. So we were talking to each other on the phone, normal phone calls, but only tw you know, every two weeks because it was just too expensive. And the rest was letters and postcards, for those of you who still remember what that is. Now today, my, I have three children, all teenagers. Uh, they started school today. Two of them actually started their last school year. They're twins, 17 years old. And I wonder how I would react if they said, Dad, I want to do a similar trip. And today, though, we at least could be connected and uh, we could check in every day with them and to see how they're doing, where they are. And so travel today, even in these difficult countries, should be much easier than, than it was at that time. They are digital natives, um, as we all call them now. Uh, data is all around them, as it is around us. But is it actually, is data all around us in all aspects? You know, we hear a lot of exponential talks here. There's actually a few areas where data, the data revolution has not started. And uh, it's very paradoxical, but the data revolution hasn't actually really started in the field of statistics, of data itself. And that's why um, the global leaders, uh, when they um, adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 big goals here, called also for a data revolution. So data revolution to, among others, check in how we are doing, um, how we are on track with ending poverty, ending hunger, um, which countries are falling behind, which are not falling behind. So basic, simple facts today in this data-rich world are actually not, not really known. And, and it's still a big challenge for, for the profession and for my profession, economics, to find out. That's why I invested in this field. That's why I want to give you this talk, because I'm convinced that economics and statistics is one of the next fields to be disrupted. And we need some type of new data machines and a real data revolution to not just help uh, those in need, but business in general and help everybody um, as a result. So what would it take to create the data, data revolution for the SDGs and in general in economics and statistics? And the, uh, the simple visual, uh, I think, has been used in different contexts today uh, and, and yesterday is, is oil. Um, oil, the resource of last century, data, the resource of this century. But like oil, in itself, it's not so useful. You need to extract it, you need to refine it, you need to clean the data, and then you can personalize the data uh, so that people can actually absorb it and possibly feed back into the system and, uh, and make it even better. So that's what this is about, to think of data machines, data refineries for statistics, for economics, for the SDGs. And what I'll show you, and I built a few of those machines, I want to show you some of them in this talk. So let me um, um, just ask you this very simple question. Right? How, how would you start with, if you build a data machine like this and you want to think of, of some of humanity's big challenges? The starting point would be just count the people, how many people there are. So how many people are we in the world now? Eight. Ah, somebody was really well informed. Eight. It was actually really funny. I was expecting seven billion, because everybody says seven billion, but that's like non-exponential thinking. So thank you for doing the 7.6 billion. So we're not yet eight billion, but congratulations. That's, I didn't expect that. So we're 7.6 billion. Uh, it's actually 
pretty accurate as of today. And so is, is the population, a simple question to you, and you have two options to answer, is population growth slow or fast today? So who of you thinks population growth is slow? So one, okay, there's a, a small group here. Who thinks it's fast? Okay, that's the clear majority, two-thirds for fast. A good exp economist has a good response, which says it depends. I look at it. Um, but the uh, minority group here was right if you look at the core question, population growth, so percentage growth. We are living in an unprecedented time of rapid population slowdown, actually. And those of you who were around in 1968, or maybe you were born in that year, you have double celebration this year. First is you have 50 years anniversary today, so uh, congratulations for that. But also you just learned that you were among the unique species in the world that has gone through the most rapid population growth ever. And there was, uh, and there was just a few years in 1968 and the surrounding years where world population growth was 2% or slightly higher. I'm born 1971, I was already below the 2%. And now we are actually at a point where we are very close to 1%. So in two years, we'll be back to 1%. So it's been basically since 70 years, since 1950, we have not been in such a situation of slow, slowing down of population growth. Now, as obviously I said, it depends because this is relative. The absolute number is still high. We are, have, um, you may know the number, it's 80 million per year population growth. Uh, same size of Germany that we're adding every year. Uh, but by the way, that peak was also a while ago. The real peak was 93 million in 88. So again, 80 million every year, that's a big number still. And so in absolute numbers, we are still growing. And you may have an idea how high we'll get as a species. And um, there's one scenario, the standard scenario by the UN, is we would get to 11 billion by 2100. There's, an, by the way, an alternative scenario that says we, the population growth will slow down even more because of education. And that means um, later childbearing, later marriage, and then actually we only get to 9 billion. Anyway, let's assume it's 10 billion. That's roughly the number that people could agree on, plus minus. Today we're at eight, close to 8 billion, as uh, one of you just mentioned. Um, that actually shows you that all the dystopian thinking about population growth is actually not as logic anymore because all of us, especially those of us who have been born a few decades ago, went through a rapid expansion of population growth from 4 billion to 8 billion in my lifetime, um, from 2 billion to 8 billion since over the last, last 100 years. So going from 8 billion to 10 billion is not the big deal anymore. There'll be challenges, there'll be opportunities, but it's not the biggest deal anymore to go from 8 billion to 10 billion. Now, still the question there, the core question, why is it happening, right? We said the population growth is going down, the total is going up. Well, it's not happening because of children. Children were 2 billion in the year 2000. Children are the 2 billion children today. And so how many children will there be in 2100? 2 billion, exactly. That's the number. That's the projection. So children 0 to 14 and that definition, if you were, went up a little bit, it'll still a straight line. So it's not children. So what's left? It's us adults. And uh, that's, we are causing population growth, and I guess we don't want to stop it, because otherwise we would need to say goodbye now, and uh, then it would not be very pleasant. So, uh, so why are adults causing population growth? What's new about us adults? Well, it's new that we live longer. Um, and we don't live long, not longer yet in the Ray Kurzweil and uh, Peter Diamantis sense that we live till 150. Some of you might do, I'm not sure yet. And actually, total lifespans have not expanded much beyond 120 over the last few decades for the maximum lifespan of a person. But it's people in the emerging markets that, especially if they survive childhood, early childhood, then live to their 50s, 60s, 70s. And it's that type of filling up of adults in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s generation and age bracket that is causing the population growth. So it's actually something that will, is inevitable, um, except we want some dramatic disaster to occur, and something that's very normal, and actually it's a good thing. It's a sign of um, the health and the wealth and the education we have created. That's what's causing population growth today. Um, by the way, if you want to know how long you live individually, 
I have created a data machine called Population.io. You can check it out and you get an estimated date. Don't be superstitious, please, otherwise uh, I get in trouble. But otherwise, look it up. Um, we launched it at a TEDx conference. What I want to do now is to think of the world in a different way. It's by income, and I want to show you then a data machine that we built. So we just did the world by age, and there's also the world by income. And that's how the world looks by income. There's many people in the, the left-hand side, but not in the very extreme left. And then there's people who earn more daily spending in dollars. So there's four groups. We'll make it simple and easy to remember. So the first group is actually the very poor, the extreme poor. More than 600 million people in the world still live on $1.90 a day. That's the global definition for extreme poverty. It's the World Bank definition. It's a definition that the Sustainable Development Goals adopted. 600 million people in extreme poverty. Um, I'll get to this later in more detail. Then on the other extreme is the rich people. Uh, to use a singularity term, those who live in abundance. Um, it's just 200 million, actually, in the world, uh, living at $110 a day, um, used as a, as a threshold for people who have very little worry about money anymore. Maybe not living in abundance, but living um, in with very little financial concern. $3,000 net per month, a family of four would be $12,000 net. 200 million, interestingly, is every second of these people is an American. So 100 million Americans, 100 million the rest of the world. But the action, as you see, is in the middle. The action is those who escape poverty, who are not in extreme destitution anymore, but still are vulnerable, 3.2 billion. And then there is the middle class, middle class, uh, 3.6 billion. So that's how the world is looking today um, based on, on income. Now, um, this is a static picture, but we're interested in the dynamic picture. We want to see how this is changing. And so the team I work with, we calculated the rate of change across these uh, transition points. And the good news is it's on average going in the right direction. Not every country, not every individual moves in, into more prosperity, but on average, the world is moving into this direction. And the numbers are as follows. So one person per second, um, roughly, rounded numbers are all these, jumps, escapes poverty today. And actually, five people per second uh, move into the middle class. So this is the most action is in that group. And that's a lot of people. Uh, how many people per year? There's some very magic number guys here in the room, but this may be too much calculation. So it's 31 seconds per year, 31 million seconds. So 150 million people per year enter the middle class, enter the consumer class. That's a billion people over six and a half years. That's where most of the dynamic in the world is taking place today. And then those who become really rich is not so many because there's not so many in that a group that uh, is close to that threshold. So it's every second, every second second one person, 0.5 people. So that's how the dynamic picture of the world is looking like today. So what I wanted to do with you now is to look deeper into one of those groups, the extreme poor, and to show you a data machine that I have created. And so that's basically uh, the situation as it was a few days ago when we presented this, uh, basically put the presentation together. But now I want to show you the dynamic one, which is here. Actually, already poverty has declined by a million since we put the presentation together. 637 million people in extreme poverty. And uh, the, as you see, the number is going down by 1.1 persons per second. but it's actually below target. So we are off track to end poverty by 2030. So this is what we want to do with this, to convey something rather complex and to remain, continue with a lot of nuance, but still to make it useful for you, for your children, for your friends. And so 600, 637 million people in extreme poverty. We are off track by 38 million. We are reducing poverty, but not fast enough. Will it get faster? Will it get better? So let's go to the next the singularity anniversary 2028. And the answer is unfortunately no. So um, will be less people in po extreme poverty, 490 million at this, uh, based on this model that I helped to put together, 6% of the world population. So it's a much better world than we used to know. But poverty reduction is rather slow. It, went, it would go down to 0 0.2 per second. It would be an interesting discussion to think of what would it take to get it back on track. And here I give you some hints, because if you go down to every country, 
you can see what the situation is. Some countries have very little extreme poverty, the, the white countries, under this definition, $1.90. Some countries will make it by 2030, the green countries. Some make progress, yellow, and some will go in the wrong direction. So that's the, the world view of how countries are doing with this fundamental target of ending poverty. And so I'm going to show you a few things. And I want to show you why you need this type of machines and these real-time models to actually understand what's happening in the world and to understand some of, to shape some of the new global headlines that we should be generating. So here's a global headline that actually this team helped to generate, and I'll show you, which is India. So India is the forefront of po global poverty reduction. You see it just because actually the clock is ticking in India even in real time almost one person per second, 40, 42 people per minute. And India explains of today's global poverty reduction 70%. So when India will run out of poor people, fortunately, uh, out of extreme poor people in three, four years, then the global effort will slow down if Africa doesn't catch up. But the global headline that I wanted to show you is again uh, coming back to India. So 68... Um, 68 million people in poverty today. So remember that number, 68 million. Let's go to the country that has actually the most poor people today. Any idea which country this is? It's actually the first time in our lifetime that this has changed, the first time. Since all of you were born, it was always India. And the first time ever, it's actually now Nigeria, 87 million now. So 87 million in Nigeria live in extreme poverty. Six people per minute are being added to the poor. So not being reducing, but being added in Nigeria today. So that actually, but the, uh, you remember the number for India is only 68 million. So, and the, the transition point was in December, January. December, January, Nigeria was 85, so it slowly went up to the negative direction. And India was 83. So that was around the time, December, it crossed over. So remember the other number, 68, 87. Just in half a year, 20 million different. See what, what's happening with momentum and demography, what demo, demography and momentum do. Uh, you create very big numbers and big gaps in a very short period of time. Now, all of this was not known because in the past, the traditional approach to this is, let's do some surveys, let's collect the numbers, let's you know, treat the numbers, and two, three years later, you would have known what has happened. But then people are not that interested anymore. It's not relevant because we live in a new world already in two, three years from now. With this, you actually can generate a global headline, and I, I'll come to this in a minute. Now, what I want to show you as well is what you could do more. So Kenya, a country I know well, I lived before I came uh, back to Europe, has 14 million poor people today, and we tried to find them, and we found them actually where they are. Um, and um, this is how poverty is distributed in Kenya now, with some counties that are doing quite well, but some others not so. This is now, this shows you where the most poor people live. There was this county I didn't know at all, although I lived in Kenya, that has actually most poor people together with this remote county that some of you might know, Turkana. So this, you need to do this type of data modeling and then you can go forward and again think further how Bungoma would do in the year 2025. 537,000 poor people, 19% in poverty, according to this projection. And so with these numbers, then you can already imagine and envision how you could use it for your project in this village or in this region, also for business, because if you can model the poor, you can also model the rich, which I'll get to in a second. But the dream would be, and the transformation in the spaces, that you move away from country maps to county maps, and that all of Africa would look like this Kenyan county map, and you have real-time data on much more granular elements, and also find out how old these people are. I wanted to show you some of the headlines that this has generated. Um, in the past, poverty and economics was rather for the nerds and for the geeks that write research papers. But here now, uh, from the Financial Times to the Washington Post, too many others then actually reported on this big moment, because that's what people are interested about, rankings, movement. First time poverty became actually a, a subject of debate in Nigerian TV, continuous uh, roundtables, discussion groups around what can you do to end poverty and to turn around the situation in Nigeria. India obviously was a very opposite situation with a number one position India is happy to lose, headline in Times of India. 
There's, by the way, another transition point happening at the end of this year, if the current projections hold that India would actually move to third place in the world's poverty ranking and Congo, Congo DRC would move up to the second place. So that's the, the big transition points in poverty. Now I want to show you another big global decision point, a transition point, and you may have already gotten the preview yesterday from Will Wiseman. Remember again these big numbers and the key brackets that I showed you, 600 million, 3.2 billion, 3.6, 200 million. So obviously if you add them up, you'll see they're the same, 3.8 billion out of a population of 7.6 billion as we learned before. It's the first time in human history, it will happen in October, first time in human history that half the world, you could say, has made it. Hasn't made it to complete wealth, but has made it to some degree of economic stability and has entered the middle class and then will, uh, with a portion of them, also the really rich ones, including some of us here in the room. And if you think about it, what would be, who is the person that will create that tipping point? Obviously, your guess is as good as mine, so um, that even my data model can't tell you yet. But if you think of the probability out of those five people entering the middle class every second, actually four are from Asia, so it's a very high chance it's from Asia. Uh, and two out of these four, or two out of these five, are actually from India. And the, the person, or there's likely to be younger person. So that's why it's somewhere in this, this visual, in this uh, scenario, the idea of a of an, you know, 20, 25-year-old Indian girl who has is connected and who is now tipping the balance together with her peers and is not just moved out of poverty, but it's becoming part of the consumer class and a potential client of yours as well. So let's go to the end of this now and go to the future. So how will these numbers look like in 10 years, as you at 20? So remember this chart here, we have the numbers that you have memorized by now, middle class 3.6 billion. So what will happen by 2028 under a base case scenario? It's not an optimistic one, it's not a pessimistic one, it's a base case scenario. And you see the big movement is on the year orange, so it goes down by almost a billion, 3.2 to 2.3. But the blue middle class goes up by more than a billion because we're many more people. So it's actually 5.2 billion people, almost two thirds of the world will become middle class. So we'll be, despite different talks in the US and sometimes in Europe, will be middle class powerhouse in the world by year 2028. Upper class rich people will be more too, proportionately rapid growth, but still you know, modest in terms of total numbers of 300 million. So that's the world in 2028, 10 years from now. But you may want to know which countries are embedded in this 5.3 billion plus the 300 million upper class. And actually, if it's interesting. If you think of, if you look at economic spending power today, and this is a proxy also for economic strength, you see that the EU and uh, USA are still at similar Sizes depends also a bit on exchange rates, China and India behind. But by 2028, it's almost like a four-year horse race. Um, and if you would add the spending power of the poor, which is not included in this chart, you would have actually a very even situation. So that's how 2028 would look like. But still, it's aggregate, and you may have known some of this, not with this accuracy. But uh, you may want to know what's more underneath these numbers. And we build another machine. I don't have the time to show you now, but it's actually in the expo, and that goes really deeper. And it shows for every country, uh, every segment. And there's a lot of interesting insights. I talked to you before about the, the rich people, 200 million going up to 300 million. Actually, China only is only at 8 million people, uh, 8 million rich people uh, in 10 years. They will only gradually move up. There's many, much more action in the middle. But one country and one income group will be 1 billion. One country, one income group, one billion people, and we're just eight billion. Any idea who that is? It's actually India, $20 a day, around $20 plus minus 10. That is one billion people. And that group is economically, will be the most powerful in Asia and be the second most powerful in the world. The only other economic group that is more powerful is, is you guys here, is the rich in the US. They have a little more power than the Indians earning $20. But that's where the future business opportunity lies. But as you saw before, you need to go a bit deeper. You need to understand how old these people are, which gender. Uh, these 1 billion Indians are more like 10 to 20, 30 years old, not 50. Um, and you need to go deeper and, uh, and count everybody. And once you have counted everybody, then you'll make everyone count. Thank you very much.